Good evening uh, for those uh, viewing us uh, in Europe and uh, good morning for those who are viewing us uh, in the West Coast, uh, in California or other parts of the US. My name is Laszlo Brust. Uh, I'm the co-director of the Democracy Institute of the Central European University. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this uh, webinar, Perspectives on Democracy. It's a conversation uh, between Vietnam government Eleni Kunaklakis and CEO Rector and President uh, Michael Ignatiev. Uh, it's an event organized uh, by the CEU Democracy Institute and the Review of Democracy, that is the online journal uh, uh, of uh, the Institute of Democracy. Uh, this is an event recorded uh, and it's also streamed uh, live uh, on the Facebook. Uh, this webinar uh, is part of a series organized by DI and by the Review of Democracy that started last year with the webinar on democracy in America. And it's regularly we stream this uh, series. So uh, welcome uh, our guest. Uh, and uh, just briefly, I would like to tell that uh, this uh, event is organized on Zoom. Uh, and uh, while uh, those who are on the Zoom uh, can uh, ask questions uh, after uh, around 40, 45 minutes uh, uh, on uh, uh, using the Zoom. In the FB, there is the, the, the Facebook, they can ask uh, questions in the Facebook comment uh, sections. So uh, finally, just uh, 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 let me tell that the uh, Democracy Institute is really uh, uh, happy to uh, announce the application, the, the publication of its first uh, newsletter that is available on the website uh, of the CEU Democracy Institute. Without uh, much ado, I uh, welcome again both of our uh, speakers and pass over the verse to Michael Ignatiev. Thank you, Lassie, and uh, welcome to everybody. I'm Michael Ignatiev, the Rector and President of Central European University. Um, it's not often that uh, CU gets to welcome a senior, very senior and distinguished American politician. It's even rarer to welcome a senior and distinguished politician who's also well known in Hungary and a friend of C CU for a long time. And so uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce Eleni Kunalakis, who is the first female Lieutenant Governor of California um, I'm not going to give you the organizational chart in California politics. All you need to know is that the lieutenant governor is the second most important public official in the state. That's the first thing. The second thing you need to know is that California is a huge state with an economy that's larger than all, all but four countries in the world with a budget in excess or GDP in excess of couple of trillion dollars. So it's a huge player in the world um, as an economy. And that's important because Eleni Kunalakis has an important mandate as Lieutenant Governor to deal with international trade and, and uh, a lot of the economic challenges facing California. Um, the other thing is that uh, California has an extraordinary reputation in global politics for being a place where a lot of democratic innovation starts, a lot of democratic protest starts, a lot of good ideas start in California, a lot of funny ideas start in California, but it's been for the whole world of democracy an enormous source of innovation. Eleni Kunalakis is also the former U.S. ambassador to Hungary and it was in that position that she got to know our university well and was a consistent supporter of our uh, efforts to sustain an open society in uh, Hungary. She was uh, ambassador in Hungary, uh, appointed by President Obama and served, I think, between 2010, 2013, somewhere in there. And so she knows Hungary well, she knows our university well, and it's a great honor to introduce her to you. And uh, my sense of uh, the, the order of events here tonight is that she will talk for uh, a little while about the issues on her mind, frame up some issues, talk about California, and then we'll open it out, a little discussion between her and me, uh, and then we'll open it up for your questions. 
and the event will end promptly at eight o'clock our time. I don't know what time it is where you are, but that's an hour. Uh, so over to you, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, and welcome. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for that gracious introduction. Thank you, Laszlo, so much for having me. Uh, it's truly wonderful to be here with you all. I'm in Los Angeles today, so we would say here, Yoregat Kivanok, and to all of you, Yoeshtet Kivanok. Uh, it's really, it's really great to be with you. And um, and I, I thought, Michael, what I would do uh, is start. Uh, start off by talking a little bit about California, because my sense is that most of us who are here today or watching on Facebook know a lot about Hungary, and we're certainly going to get to that, and, and, I, and I look forward to that conversation. But what I thought I would do is just start talking a little bit about California in order to be able to have sort of a basis of comparison um, that helps to certainly frame my thinking both about my own state, but also about Hungary now a few years uh, since I was there, though of course I still do um, uh, follow events in, in Budapest and in, in Hungary in general. Um, so uh, what um, I thought I would start with is our population makeup, uh, because both in Hungary and in California, we are talking a lot about immigration. And California is a pretty extraordinary uh, place. Uh, we um, are about 27% foreign born. 14% uh, is the national average. So we're significantly um, more uh, the beneficiary of American uh, immigration into this country than uh, the rest of the United States about one in two of us have at least one foreign born uh, parent. So 25% of all the immigrants in the United States live here in California. Um, we also are very attractive um, to uh, people who are here, not necessarily as permanent residents, but as uh, green card holders. And we have uh, about three uh, 0.15 million Californians or people here on green cards, which is number one in the country as well. So when you see what that means in terms of our demographics, it's quite striking. Uh, we are what is called a minority majority state, which means that no single ethnic group has a majority in California. We're about 36% white, 39% Latino. Um, our Asian community makes up about 15%, African American 6%, Native American uh, 1%. There are four states in the United States that are minority majority and California is one of them. Uh, so um, what I often say when I talk about uh, California is uh, in, especially in terms of our economic success, which you just noted and what I will get to in a moment, is that uh, we have exercised this formula, whether it was planned or not, and I would argue that it was not exactly planned, but we have, uh, uh, we have now, uh, our, we're very far down on this, on this uh, model where we have uh, quite a bit of immigration and we have an intensive, investment in education. And immigration plus education has led to California becoming the fifth largest economy in the world. And as uh, you noted, the place where so much happens first in the world. Uh, so so uh, in terms of our education, and again, I think it's helpful to understand a little bit of the scale California has about 3 million students currently enrolled in public higher education alone. So just public higher education. Our community college system, our California State University system, 
and our University of California system. There are private universities like Caltech and Stanford and, and uh, USC, uh, but in just in terms, and I'm not talking about our, our uh, K-12 education, just higher education. And this is extraordinary. And so when you look at who these 3 million students are in our public higher education system, blended overall, about 40% of them are the first in their family to go to college. So this is a remarkable profile. And I would argue, frankly, that there is no place in the world that has uh, a profile like the state of California. And as many of the challenges, there are many, many challenges that we face here in our state. But in terms of the driver of the economic engine, and the openness and the welcoming nature of uh, California society, uh, these two things together really create that climate and give us the tools to, uh, uh, to succeed. I wanna give one, uh, one uh, note on the politics of our state because I think this is very important as well. Uh, in the 2020 election, uh, it was obviously, as we know, uh, an election that took many, many days uh, nationally to determine who the president was. Of course, we know uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, Kamala, of course, a daughter of California, uh, prevailed in that election. But in California, it wasn't even close. First of all, it was important to California voters. 80% of registered voters in California participated in that election. It was the most ever. And Joe Biden got 63.5% of the vote to Donald Trump's 34.3%. 11.1 million Californians voted for uh, Joe Biden. And it was, as a result, Joe Biden became the first president, uh, first candidate uh, for any office to ever get uh, more than 10 million votes in a st single state in the history of the United States. Uh, so it gives you uh, a little bit of the idea of who we are and, uh, and what our attitudes are here in this state. Um, I thought I would also talk a little bit about the size of the California economy, because obviously uh, this is uh, quite a remarkable part of our story as well. Michael, as you noted, uh, if we were a country, which we are not, uh, but if we were, we would be the fifth largest economy in the world. We are the largest consumer market in the United States. We are number one for foreign direct investment of all the states number one in two-way trade, number one in manufacturing, uh, number one in access to capital. And uh, I remember uh, when Prezi uh, was making its way from Budapest to Silicon Valley, and of course a big reason for them to, to want to come to California was access to capital to grow their company, which they did uh, very successfully, but they are not alone. Last year, uh, $67 billion in venture capital funding was awarded here in the state of California. That is three times the second highest state uh, for access to venture capital. We also have had about a 22% increase in applications for new business licenses uh, and 20 of the 100 fastest growing companies in the world are headquartered here in our state. So we are truly a leader in many fields, in clean tech, in high tech, in entertainment, in agriculture. And we pride ourselves in the fact that we aren't just uh, a traditional economy, but we are uh, on the cutting edge of innovation, particularly when it comes to uh, renewable energy and uh, clean tech. So as of, la as of this year, our number one export are zero emission vehicles. And that's largely uh, thanks to Tesla, 
uh, but there are dozens of companies alone ju just in the uh, zero emission vehicle space alone. Um, so we uh, uh, have had, like everyone in, in the world, a, a challenging time over the last year and a half with COVID-19. Um, but there are some stories within our COVID response that are worth uh, mentioning. Uh, California was the first state in the United States to issue a stay-at-home order. Our public health officials at the county level, working with public health officials at the state level, uh, looked at the science, sounded the alarm, recognized uh, that this was serious. And way before the federal government under Donald Trump was ready to acknowledge what was happening, we were already acting. So we were the first state to issue the stay-at-home order. Currently, we have both the lowest infection rates in the country and the highest percentage of people vaccinated in, in, in the country and one of the highest in the world. Uh, we have uh, about 70% of Californians at this point who have received uh, at least one dose. Meanwhile, with our full reopening set for tomorrow, uh, we are using the tools of uh, our um, uh, uh, of our economic strength to prepare for this recovery. And we have a, a budget surplus of about $100 billion that we are able to use to spur the economy to help in particular small businesses that bore the brunt in the service, service economy especially, uh, but, uh, but also of course using some of that surplus to help the Californians who struggle the most to keep their head above water because, of course, as we know, uh, one of our successes is that people do, no matter what you read in the news, uh, people do want to live in California. And during the last year, our home prices increased substantially and the cost of living here is quite high. So uh, that is um, a little bit about our state and some of uh, the things that I think um, are useful for all of you to know because, um, well, let me just say, Michael, that my three and a half years in Hungary, uh, really four years in terms of the time I spent at the State Department getting ready to go, uh, was uh, really um, one of the most extraordinary and special and important periods uh, of my life. And um, I continue to uh, do what I can to stay up to date on events and, and issues um, uh, that uh, and, and events uh, happening in Hungary. But I see it through this prism of my day job, which is being Lieutenant Governor of the largest uh, and most uh, economically um, uh, strong state in the United States. Uh, you know, you mentioned we have about 40 million people uh, to Hungary's 10. In fact, where I am right now in Los Angeles County, uh, this county alone is about the size of the population of Hungary. And our economy is somewhere around 12 times the size, just our state. Uh, so it's a very different place. But um, as uh, we go about our work and facing the challenges we have, and again, there are many, uh, at the same time, uh, there is so much um, excitement and inspiration. And frankly, that comes from the very first thing that I talked about, which is our diversity and uh, the fact that for so much of our history, people from around the world have come here unencumbered by uh, their past to build a better life for themselves and their family. And we all uh, are a beneficiary of their hard work. Great. Thank you, Eleni. Um, that's a very stirring picture of, of, of California and, and it raises, I want to focus this in on some of the challenges for um, democracy. Um, I guess one of the, the most obvious points you're making is that ethnic and religious and 
all the forms of diversity are an enormous source of strength to California, enormous source of strength to your democracy, um, and an enormous source of your your economic creativity. I mean, you're 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 pulling in people from all over the world who want to work in your in your industries. You're pulling in people uh, who want to start at the bottom and get up, um, and that's a picture of a healthy democracy that is very different from Central and Eastern Europe. Many of those countries have made a different choice. For them, democracy is maintaining the national identity of their countries defined mostly in monoethnic terms. And so there's a tremendous resistance, I think, in Hungary, not just um, uh, in Hungary, uh, also in Poland and the Czech Republic, towards the very story you're telling. Uh, and I just wonder whether you had any thoughts about that. Um, uh, I guess the question is, um, what's your story about why your story, that diversity is a source of strength for democracy, just doesn't, has so much difficulty working in and being persuading people in Central and Eastern Europe. Any thoughts about that? Well, I have a lot of thoughts and um, gosh, I mean, where, where do you begin? I, I, I think you know, one of the things that I used to think about when I was in Budapest um, is very often when we had visitors, uh, we would take them down to the Danube, to the, um, uh, to the uh, uh, monument of those who had been killed in the Second World War Jews who'd been murdered and thrown into the Danube, and they're the the shoes that are um, that are uh, bronzed um, that are part of that monument. And uh, I come from a town with river, Sacramento, and I used to try to imagine what it would be like um, as a civic leader in my community of Sacramento. What would it be like if we had a monument like that on the Sacramento River, where some of our people had arrested other of our people, including children, and killed them in cold blood and thrown them systematically into the river. Uh, it, I thought about it, you know, I, I, I know that when you're there, those kinds of stories, whether they're stories of the Holocaust, which were, uh, you know, so uh, hard to even conceive of, um, or the other stories of, of challenges of Hungary's past. Uh, we don't have those kinds of things to the same degree. Now, of course, we have, um, for our Native American population, there were severe traumas that have happened. Uh, we had internment of the Japanese in the Second World War, no question about it. But for the the size of the population, and then, of course, the fact that it's a stagnant population, most people who are there, their parents, their grandparents, their great parents, grandparents, they were all part of it. Whereas for me in Sacramento, for my family, you know, we were the first, my father was the first one uh, to come ever to Sacramento. We, we didn't even have, you know, we didn't even have on Memorial Day relatives to visit. We would have to go back to Greece. Uh, so, so it's very different. I think that history plays a big role uh, in all of this. And so I guess that's why I think it's so important to recognize the California model because we, we do not, um, most of us uh, are, are unencumbered by that kind of history um, that allows people, I think not to get too deep into the psychology of it, but allows people to um, be more open-minded in general, and maybe even a little less fearful of um, what can happen when divisions become so deep uh, mm -hmm. that people, one group of people can dehumanize another or use power uh, to, uh, uh, to those kinds of ends. So, so Michael, I guess the first part, the first thing I would say to your question is that history um, and again, I'm Greek American. I, I love going to Greece and I, I love being immersed in the history of ancient Greece and even modern Greece. But, that, but, but to recognize that 
uh, it's not useful to let history um, keep you from imagining other things, other ways um, that are possible. And, and I would also go to, again, then this California model that if you can look at a place in the world where immigration plus education has led toward economic success. And of course, we are a very open society and liberal democracy here, uh, that this is a model of what can work and is worth pursuing rather than closing your doors and, and, and being afraid of change. Wendy, let me, let me uh, push you on another issue, which is um, the, how, how you manage um, democracy in uh, what you call a minority majority society. Um, I, I spent a uh, couple of fascinating weeks in LA myself for a book I wrote called The Ordinary Virtues and spent a lot of time with community leaders and went from one community to the other. I went, spent a lot of time with, uh, in Boyle Heights. I spent a lot of time in, in, um, in Compton. I spent a lot of time all over LA, uh, which is one of the most complex um, uh, diverse uh, political communities I've ever been in. And I, I wondered how it held together, frankly. That is, um, you celebrate the diversity and as a Canadian, you know, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all the way with you, Eleni. It's the only thing I understand. But I, I did go to LA and think to myself, how the hell does this thing hold together? And it's a real question because, as you know, I hardly need to tell you, in 1965, it blew up in the Watts riots. It blew up again in 1992 in the Rodney King thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous achievement that, the, that these competing communities live and share the same democracy. But I had a sense that, you know, one little spark could blow this thing up. And, and the spark is often policing that provokes one, one community or sets one community against the other. And so I want to celebrate what you're saying about California democracy, but I, I felt, it was, I felt it, was, it, was, it was perhaps more fragile than you're describing. I'm just wondering whether you could talk a little bit about that. Um, well, certainly when you talk about the African-American community, this is, this is a conversation now that the murder of George Floyd has opened up across uh, the country and uh, the experience of the African American community in our country, in our state, uh, the level of uh, inequity and uh, and institutionalized racism, we are only just beginning to pull back the curtain on um, and to figure out what is the best way for us all to rectify this, starting with uh, criminal justice reform and, uh, and, and frankly, looking in the mirror and asking ourselves, what more do we need to do and how do we understand, uh, how do we understand this issue in a way that can make a meaningful difference? Um, but I also mention, and I think this is important, is that you know, the African-American uh, community represents about 6% in California. 39% of Californians are Latinx, and another 15% are AAPI, just between Latinx, ethnic Latino, plus AAPI, just those two groups, 22 million Californians are part of that group. Mm -hmm. And so when you think of it through the diversity lens of those two very large group, two of the three, highest is Latino, second highest is white, third is AAPI. So when you look just at the first and the third largest ethnic groups in our state, really the question is, where's the opportunity? Where is the ability to pursue that American dream? And if those groups feel that they have the opportunity to pursue uh, a better life for themselves and their family, what you have is enormous buy-in in our system. And that supports our political system in Sacramento, as well as our congressional delegation. 
uh, up in Sacramento, and I, I don't have the figures off the top of my head. I should. Um, but if you walk down the halls of the Capitol uh, with me, where my office is, you will see enormous diversity. And when I was a kid, when I was in high school, I had a summer job working for a state senator. And I walked around, and I'm a fairly petite daughter of an immigrant who started out as a farm worker, and there was nobody uh, who looked like me. Uh, they were the whole capital was full of white men, the, the elected officials, the lobbyists, everybody. Uh, and there were some women as well, but nowhere near in terms of the staffing and, and the, the lobbyists and the people who work in and around them, completely different. Now uh, we have uh, uh, Latinas, we have uh, we have African American. We have yeah, API. Like it, it's incredible the level of diversity that you see represented, and um, and so that Michael, that's really what I would look to when you want to understand sort of the strength of our democracy. It almost always comes down to the question of: Do the people feel that democracy is delivering for them? Do they feel that it's fair? Do they feel they're getting a piece of the pie? Now, we have tremendous income inequality in the country and in our state. There is no question about it. We have major, major issues with poverty, especially down here in uh, the Los Angeles area. Uh, but at the same time, when people feel that the harder they work, the better they can do, or th that, that, that opportunity exists for us, which again, let me go back to that percentage. Three million students enrolled in public higher ed education, 40% as a bl blended rate, 40% uh, the first in their family to go to college. Those are the places where, where I think you can look to find the answers to your questions about the strength of California's democracy. Let me ask you a weird, a weird question. Uh, I'm wondering about whether the 34 percent who voted for Mr. Trump uh, in a state that is in which the Democratic Party has a lock, whether they feel included or excluded. I mean, what about them? They're 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 tremendous. Uh, um, they're making a lot of noise, Eleni, and I just wonder whether there is a risk when you have single party dominance in a state for a very long time that it begins to create a kind of discontent with democracy that might be very difficult for you to handle long term? Well, Michael, that's a very good question. And the irony of, uh, of uh, this, you know, dual uh, kind of profile that I have of having been ambassador in Hungary, and now I'm Lieutenant Governor of California is that when I was in Budapest, we were raising concerns over uh, the two-thirds uh, supermajority of Fidesz and what that meant for plurality uh, and representation uh, and uh, 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 voices, you know, di different voices being heard and having having a role. And in California, in our state legislature, we have a two-thirds supermajority of Democrats. The difference is the level of plurality and uh, that I think was probably best exemplified if you look at the extraordinary power that Viktor Orban has in Hungary, his ability to consult family members. That that is that is a remarkable uh, consolidation example of consolidation of power. And then you look at our governor of California who is working 24 seven with members of our legislature, hearing the needs and the interests and the demands of a very diverse representation. So even though it is a supermajority of one party, there is quite a bit of uh, plurality of thinking uh, in Sacramento. And in some ways in this very, particular point of time where there is so much division in Washington, where Democrats and Republicans are having a very difficult time finding common ground, starting with the fact that the facts, they, they, don't, they don't agree on, the, on basic facts that are knowable, mm -hmm. facts available through fact-finding 
uh, that kind of discord is not serving the country as well as it could. In California, we have enormous amount of plural thinking in Sacramento, but frankly, we can't be divided over things like, you know, who won the election, which is just, it's, it's absurd that the Republican leadership educated people are buying into the promotion of what is called the big lie that somehow in spite of all of the facts, all of the knowable truth, they will stand up to their constituents and, and say something that is absolutely, utterly a falsehood. Um, we don't have that kind of problem in Sacramento. And that is, I think, a very good thing for us in our state and has allowed us that in the times where the governor and the legislature and the other political leadership in the state, including myself, have had to come together, for instance, around COVID, uh, we have done a, a pretty good job. And again, in hindsight, there are many things we could have done better. But, uh, but generally speaking, I think most Californians do think that the leadership was organized and adequate enough to be able to lead us through this difficult time in a successful way. Let me ask you an another question in which, which is about social media and the enormous power of uh, the corporations that started in garages and back doors and back lots in California and now have such a huge influence on democratic debate around the world. Um, in Europe, there's a lot of concern about um, the power, not merely of social media, but of the corporations that run social media, and a lot of concern about what this portends for democracy, given that they basically own the, the public space. I'm just wondering, this is a difficult question for you, because you know these, these companies are generating enormous amount of revenue and jobs for your state. They're terrific for your state. But is it possible that they're dangerous for democracy and need to be regulated, Eleni? What do you, what do you think about that? Uh, so again, we are the birthplace of the fourth industrial revolution. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, but we also have very, very active citizens and very strong civil society. So um, as government and elected leadership, political leadership is trying to catch up with this question of what do we do about an overabundance of power in the hands of tech companies, individuals also come at, you know, rise up and lead. And uh, the best example of that is a fellow named Alistair McTaggart in San Francisco. He was a real estate guy. Um, but he knew enough people in technology to see that the United States, the federal government was not doing enough on privacy protections. So he wrote a bill. He actually wrote an initiative and he started going uh, to get people to sign this initiative. As soon as it looked like he might actually qualify this initiative that was solely his brainchild with a couple people who he asked for advice and think tank work. When that happened, uh, members of the legislature brought him in and said, you don't have to put this to a vote of the people. We'll turn it into a bill and we'll just pass it. So that is how CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, was first passed. Two years in, Alistair looked at it and said, well, it's good, but it could be better. It could be closer to GDPR in Europe. So in the last election cycle, Californians voted overwhelmingly in support and passed what's called CEPRA, uh, which when it comes into effect, which is uh, about a year and a half from now with a year look back, so 2022 and then 2023 fully, uh, will bring California closer into alignment uh, with GDPR in Europe uh, than any other part of the United States or the United States as a whole. So one of the things, Michael, that we're really interested in doing, and uh, uh, my uh, close uh, uh, friend, um, 
uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, who I, I don't remember if he came to Budapest, but he was, he's the ambassador from the European Union to the United States, Stavros Lambrinidis. Uh, he and Karin Olaf's daughter, who was ambassador in Hungary when I was there and who is now in Washington, we have been having some conversations about how we can do more to raise awareness for this alignment and find the ability to partnership at the subnational level between California and our European partners. Um, because I think that what we saw during, uh, during the uh, Trump administration is that California really emerged as a very powerful transatlantic partner and very reliable over time uh, transatlantic partner to Europe, both through what I was just talking about with, um, uh, with CCPA and CIPRA and GDPR, but also, frankly, through the fact that when Trump uh, tried to steer the United States out of the Paris Accord, California, with our authority to regulate our own emissions, incredibly powerful tool for us, stayed in the Paris Accords. Let me, let me um, we should probably move in a minute or two to questions from the audience because we've got 15 minutes left and I'm, I'm having so much fun talking to you that I've got to be restrained and not take the whole time up. But I did have one final question, which is just a kind of step back. You, you, you have a mandate in relation to international trade. You have a mandate in terms of thinking about the California economy. Is, is there anything out there that keeps you folks awake at night about the future of the California economy? Um, I ask this because a lot of people are actually afraid of China. Um, and it generates a lot of internal um, stuff in, in, in our political systems across the world. It calls for protectionism, calls for renationalizing supply chains, pulling up the drawbridge. Um, and a lot of this is driven by a democratic instinct that we've got to protect our economy for our people. And, um, and China is basically a, a long-term strategic threat, uh, not just to our economies, but to um, the capacity of democracies to control their own uh, economies. I'm just wondering how, how you think about that issue. It's an issue about protectionism. It's an issue about renationalizing of supply chains. It's an issue about maintaining a sense of confidence in California that we can run a great economy that's open to the world because that may come under a lot of pressure in the next 15, 20 years. Do you follow what my question is about? Yes, of course, and, and it's, it, it's broad. So maybe I can, I'll just keep the lens drawn back a little bit, but you know, of course I've been reading about the, um, uh, the debate over uh, the Chinese university moving into Budapest. Um, and of course the juxtaposition between that and um, the driving out of Central European University is, is uh, it's a staggering uh, comparison. <laughs> you know, it, it's Fair staggering. Enough. And I guess, you know, and, and, and let me also say this, you know, as I mentioned, California is 15% AAPI. We do not have a, or we have a much less xenophobic society than I think most places, which is part of what makes us such a beacon and so attractive for people coming from India or coming from anywhere in the world, China included. Um, so I don't wanna be in any way disparaging of the, of the Chinese people, but obviously there are some really serious issues between the United States and China right now, between our NATO allies and China right now. And, uh, and, and, and that uh, is probably the single most important and most consequential foreign policy issue facing the United States and our allies in the world. But having said that, I guess when I think, think of it through the prism of, you know, if I imagine myself sitting in my office, my old office in the Chancery on Sabat Sagter, uh, thinking of it in this terms, that Hungary, that Viktor Orban drove out CEU and is 
courting a Chinese university. And what does that really mean to the Hungarian people? And I can't help but thinking, well, look at the decisions that the governments of Hungary made on behalf of their citizens in the 20th century. They chose the wrong side in the First World War, the wrong side in the Second World War, and ended up on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain with devastating impacts to its country and its people. Now, I happen to believe that the Hungarian people are remarkably gifted people, incredibly uh, talented and creative and smart and, uh, you know, intellectual and musical and all of these just incredible gifts. If it people are framing this in terms of who you're aligning your future with, I would hope to see the Hungarian people want to align themselves in the strongest possible way with Europe, with their native ally, uh, NATO allies, and with the United States, which ultimately, again, with, with all the mistakes that were made, it was the United States that was the partner uh, with, uh, uh, to help bring Hungary, liberate Hungary um, after, uh, you know, through the, the, the end of the, of the Soviet Union. And, and so, so I know that the Hungarian people are going to have uh, a choice. The, their voices can still uh, be heard in Hungary. And I guess my hope, and it, and it is a heartfelt hope because I just have enormous affection for the Hungarian people, uh, that they choose uh, to um, align themselves with, with the West. There you have it, folks. Thank you, Eleni. That was great. Let me, um, uh, let me open it up for questions. I want to see some hands here. I want to see some, uh, I'm looking in the chat window. I want to make sure anybody has a question for the Lieutenant Governor gets a chance to ask it. And while you're putting your questions together, a little supplementary for you on this. You seem to be saying to me, you have no real fears of Chinese competition um, harming or damaging the- uh, Oh, no, the I didn't say that at all. You, you, okay. No, no, what I, what I said is that uh, the relationship and the issues that the United States and China have before them, um, for our country, these are the most consequential issues for the future of our country and the world right now, the most important foreign policy issue facing us and our allies. And there are very, very serious differences and issues at hand. Uh, and the, California is disproportionately impacted, uh, certainly in terms of our trade, uh, the tariffs dispute impacted us significantly. So there's no question uh, that we have great concerns. We are the target of uh, more cyber attacks than any other state in the country. Uh, and, uh, and there are very serious issues. Uh, what I'm saying is I don't uh, want to prejudge any of those outcomes um, because I'm very hopeful that the new administration, and by the way, Tony Blinken, whose father was ambassador to Hungary, uh, very much at the helm at the State Department. Uh, this, is, uh, this is going to be very, very important. Um, what I'm saying is a subnational leader uh, and, and uh, lieutenant governor of a state that is disproportionately going to be impacted by what those outcomes are, that um, we are hoping for within the competition uh, that we will have uh, the ability to resolve some of the significant differences that we have. Right, right. Okay. Um, questions, folks? Now's your chance. Don't be shy. Eleni's not shy. I'm not shy. Make sure you have a question. You want to make sure you, you ask it. Um, I, uh, again, while we're waiting, for, oh, oh, I think I see, yep. Uh, 
Ovidio Cariani, is that right? Uh, unmute yourself, Ovidio, and and uh, thank you so much, a, Michael, a, for a question for, for you. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation, both of you. The question is this: I mean, Donald Trump is out of history, hopefully. The problem is, I think that he left something, a dilemma, the dilemma of identity. Identity versus rights. Eileen, what do you think about this? How is in California this? Uh, so that's a very good question. And um, what is the book I just read? Uh, in the Dark Room? um yeah. by Susan Faludi the uh, writing about her father and and his identity and uh I always found the question of identity in Hungary and the way that Hungarians pondered and yeah. and 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 worked around that uh to be so interesting so fascinating and there's no question that it's hit the United States in a way that uh that that is is a little different, I think, than maybe even, you know, yeah. the, just even in the 10 or 20 years. And there are a lot more of these questions. I mean, we uh, are taking down statues. We are renaming streets and renaming schools. Those kinds of things didn't happen here to the, the way that we saw them, that I saw them and heard about them in Hungarian history and in where I live in San Francisco, there was a vote of the uh, school board uh, to change the majority of the names of the elementary schools, uh, just take them out because they were all in one way or another associated with a colonial past and, a, and white supremacy. And everyone was just sort of shocked, including by the way, American presidents. Um, so, so we are in a different era where those kinds of questions are, yeah. are being considered. And, and I will tell you, I think it's difficult because, and again, I, I'm Greek American, I'm very, very proud of my, of my heritage, but I try not to let my heritage or the history of Greece and have any kind of negative, um, drive me in in a way that would hold, hold me back from believing uh, as I do, which is that uh, we do not, people should not be held, uh, you know, have the sins of the father, the sins of the father. And how do we, how do we both allow for people to be uh, to be unencumbered by the history of the fact while having a very clear reckoning with the inequities and the historic crimes of the past as a society. Uh, we're, we're engaged in that right now and it's not easy. And, and again, I think that uh, we can all learn from uh, some of the ways that, that uh, uh, Germany, uh, with the German question dealt with the aftermath of the Second World War, the way that uh, that Austria and Hungary, you know, did not as much. All all of these things now are part of our of our town square, you know, our our conversation. But but they're very difficult because it's a balance: knowing your history, understanding your history, being accountable for the the inequities of the past, but also allowing people to be unencumbered enough in their daily life that they can they can be productive and happy. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there's a question from George Tilesh. George, thank you. a question. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Great to see you again, Alani. Um, the, the question concerns education. So I, I'm just calling out a few things that you have referenced. Uh, one is the special relationship that you have forged with the, with the European Union uh, during Trump times, uh, as well as your, you know, California specific promise in digital and AI and all these emerging technologies that are becoming very much mainstream. And thirdly, your role uh, amongst many others, uh, the, your key role as the chairperson of uh, the UC board. So the, your, your specific exposure to 
all questions education, especially higher education. Uh, what do you think uh, regarding the emerging partnerships between European, the European Union and the Biden administration regarding cooperation in everything transatlantic trade and technology? We hear a lot of these words these days. Are there any lessons arising from the special relationship that you built from the European Union when it comes to education in the broadest sense, uh, when it comes to you know, digital preparedness, you mentioned cybersecurity attacks and all these kinds of things. So are there any lessons from the last four or five years uh, that you, can, you, can, you would consider uh, as good advice uh, in approximating European Union education interests and U.S. interests in digital. Well, it's nice to see you, George, uh, and uh, thank you for being here. So uh, during the Trump years, we really um, did ramp up our engagement with Europe to, uh, to advance, particularly in the, in the areas of climate cooperation and um, now kind of scoping out what, what more we might do in the areas of, of, of cooperation or around privacy, uh, but also on, um, on trade. Uh, and so, so that is ongoing. I, what can the Biden administration kind of learn from our four years? Well, you know, I think one issue really, uh, climate is a, is a very big deal. And I had the opportunity to do a virtual welcome with the crown prince of Norway not too long ago. Uh, and uh, uh, they, we had this great green screen behind us. So it looked like we were sitting in the same room somehow located underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, it was really terrific, but uh, the Norwegians have advanced um, offshore wind. Uh, California is looking to um, make significant inroads in development of offshore wind. We have a very deep continental shelf, so we can't just anchor them traditionally to the ground. They have to be a sort of floating model. Uh, and uh, uh, so there's quite a bit uh, that we have been doing, working in partnership with, with Europe and in, in the um, uh, addressing climate change, both for, through the um, uh, clean energy but and renewable energy, but also through um, technologies and carbon capture and using um, the power of investment to drive uh, the innovation in this space. Uh, so the good news is that um, we now have a federal government um, led, by the way, with members, several members of the cabinet are from California. As I mentioned, our vice president is from California. Um, but uh, but they, um, they're at the helm now. Um, we don't know what the future uh, will hold. I am very hopeful that the American people will recognize that the Biden-Harris leadership and, and consistent, comprehensive, fact-driven uh, uh, rational thinking and uh, cooperation with our allies will be uh, always attractive to the American people. Um, but in California, um, there is so much um, support for those same priorities and values uh, that we will continue no matter what to be stalwart and unshakable. And I think that is helpful to this administration um, as they engage with the world uh, over the next, you know, three or seven years. Eleni, we got time for one more question, which is coming to you from Facebook. It's a rather good one and relates to your experience as ambassador in Hungary. As a U.S. ambassador in Hungary, how did you manage to influence Hungarian politics without seeming like foreign external influence? How did you manage this business of trying to push the regime in certain ways without appearing to be, you know? Um, so thank you for the question. Um, definitely a good question and a, an important issue, and we will. Uh, hopefully soon have a, a new U.S. ambassador in Hungary, and this will be a question for her or him. 
Uh, so, you know, Colleen Bell, who was ambassador uh, after me, is here in California. She's the executive director of the California Film Commission. Uh, very, very important in that part of our industry here, which is very important to our economy and jobs and innovation, et cetera. And Colleen and I talk about this quite often. Um, but the bottom line is that during the Obama administration, our uh, orders were to always engage with the Hungarian people as and the Hungarian government as a friend and as an ally, but that as a friend and ally, it was our responsibility to raise concerns when we saw domestic policies that could undermine the fabric of Hungarian democracy in general, but in specific to the point where it could be clearly out of sync with the values that underpin NATO and the values that underpin Hungary's membership in the European Union. So that that's how, uh, you know, that was the direction, the orders that I was under, that Colleen was under, I think was different uh, in the Trump administration, but I think uh, that the next ambassador will uh, probably be tasked in exactly the same way. Thank you, Eleni. That's, I think, where we're going to have to leave it. All I can say is I wish you and Colleen had been in the chair when we ran into our little problem with uh, the Orban regime. I'm serious. It might have made a real difference. Uh, the, this is something that needs to be said over and over and again, which is the, the American defense of higher education overseas is a crucial element of what uh, America needs to be doing. And when America's absent, the local bad guys um, start giving us a hard time. This was certainly our lived experience at uh, CEU. I don't mind. I'm being very blunt about it, but uh, that's how that's how I would call it. And that's why your answer is so um, relevant and so important. Look, on behalf of CEU, on behalf of the Democracy Institute, on behalf of everybody who was listening, Eleni, thank you so much. You've been a very good friend of the university. Uh, Marcus got a PhD with us. We're delighted to have a Kunalakis alumni, um, and uh, you'll always be welcome at CU, and we hope we see you soon, either digitally or in person. Best of all, in person. You have many friends in Hungary. Thanks so much for doing this today. Good night. Thank you.